Okay, check out the crazy matrix I just cooked up. How would you enjoy the prospect of having to compute the row reduced echelon form for this matrix on a test? How much do you like doing Gauss elimination when the first number is 13? Yet, the row reduced echelon form of this matrix is very easy to see. So while I keep talking, if you're not interested in what I'm saying, just look at the matrix and try to determine its row reduced echelon form without firing a single shot, without doing any Gaussian elimination. It's possible. So of course, row reduced echelon form is all about revealing the relationship among the columns. And we perform Gaussian elimination to bring the matrix to the row reduced echelon form so that we're able to see the relationship among the columns that we previously could not see. But this is a funny example that has no applications, no practicality, except I think it'll help you understand the row reduced echelon form a little bit better. This is kind of an opposite situation. This is a situation where, unless I made some mistake, the relationships, the relationships among the columns are easy to see. So then you'll see in a moment that you can go both ways from the row reduced echelon form to the relationship among the columns, and also from the relationship among the columns to the row reduced echelon form, at which the point of the row reduced echelon form would be diminished because there is no use. There is no use in determining the row reduced echelon form if you already know the relationship among the columns. You would only do it in order to find out what that relationship is. So that's why it's more of a novelty problem than a problem with real applications. Yet it's insightful. So what is the relation? What are the relationship among the columns? And I think they're easy to see. So let's talk about the second column. I'll give you just a moment. You can pause the video if you'd like. But I think it's easy to see that the second column is twice the first. That's right. Let's look at the third column. I think it's evident that the third column is linearly independent from these. Because the only way to be linearly dependent on these columns is to be a strict multiple of those columns, and it's not. So this one is a new, new column in the sense that it's linearly independent from the ones that came before. Let's look at this column. Well, I think it's kind of evident that this column is the sum of the first and the third. Okay, can you take a crack at the fourth column? I think the fourth column, it's not too hard to see that it's because it's a hundred plus the first column. So you can express it as a hundred of the third column plus the first column. And then the last column, because of what I did here, is actually linearly independent from the ones that came before it. This is plenty to determine the row reduced echelon form, which will have this form. So the first column is the pivot column. And the first pivot column always looks like this. Notice how we're, what would have been incredibly hard Gaussian elimination is not even necessary. And I submit, this is test taking advice. If on your test, you're supposed to calculate the row reduced echelon form of the matrix. I would say more often than not, it's a matrix like this, for which you can just see if you took a close enough look at it. That's how my colleagues come up with examples with problems to put on the test. We think of a matrix for which we know the answer and give that to you. So, some test taking advice. And then, let me jump to the third column. The third column is also a pivot column, so the third column will necessarily look like this, because no matter what the matrix is, the first pivot column always looks like this, the second pivot column always looks like this, the third pivot column will be 0, 0, 1, 0, the fourth pivot column, if it's available, will be 0, 0, 0, 1, the columns, the pivot columns, are always the consecutive columns of the identity matrix, always. Uh, if the one appears in some other, Slot, that's what the swapping of the rows is for, to make sure that this is the case. Okay, so now let's fill in this non-pivot column. Well, 
it's the second column here is twice the first column. And in the process of Gauss elimination, that relationship would be preserved. That means that in the final form, this column will still be twice this column. And if this column is twice this one, and this one becomes this, well then the second column must become this. Okay. Let's look at the third column. In the original matrix, it is first plus third. So in the final form, it will still be first plus third. So what is first plus third? It's one, one, zero, zero. Right? It, because it is first plus third in the first form, in the original form, it's first plus third in the final form. And since we know first, and since we know third, we know what first plus third is. And this one is a hundred times third plus first. So all we have to do here is evaluate a hundred times third plus four, plus first. A hundred times third plus first. That's it. The final column is a pivot column. It's literally independent from the columns that came before it, so it's got to be this. So this is, in a way, in an impractical way, a marvelous example where you only have to imagine what doing the road, what doing Gauss elimination would have entailed. And it's kind of magical to know this is the power of linear algebra. Knowing, because he's giving you the big picture, knowing what the interpretation of the answer is and what its meaning is, you can very often skip the cumbersome details and go straight to the answer. This may be an impractical example, but you'll see tons of practical examples that illustrate this power of linear algebra. So there you go. This is the row reduced echelon form for that matrix. You can use MATLAB or Wolfram Alpha to check if you don't, or do it by hand. I don't think you will, of this matrix. Okay, let me ask you, uh, two, actually three questions related to this entire discussion. I'll give you answers for the two of them, and I'll save the third one, I'll let you think about it, and I'll save it for the next video, which we'll probably have to record at a future date, because it is now getting dark, and I'm not sure what kind of lighting I'm working with. Okay, question. If you have a square invertible matrix A, square Invertible matrix A. What is its row reduced echelon form? It's kind of, excuse me, drop my chuck. It's kind of a question like this. A could be arbitrarily crazy, yet you know its row reduced echelon form. Think about it for one moment or pause the video, and I will reveal the answer in a moment. Well, because the columns are linearly independent, every column is a pivot column. It's linearly independent from the columns that came before it. It has to be a pivot column. Pivot columns always look like this. And the row reduced echelon form of this matrix will have the same, will consist only of pivot columns. Therefore, the row reduced echelon form of A is the identity matrix, regardless of what A is, as long as you know that it's invertible, which is a synonym for saying its columns are linearly independent. All right, that's question number one. Here comes question number two, for which I will reveal the answer. Think about this. Suppose you have an invertible matrix A, and you stick them into a matrix side by side. So if it's 10 by 10, this matrix is 10 by 20. What is the row reduced echelon form of this matrix? So I'll pause the video if you'd like to think about it. Of course, it's all about guessing the dependence among the relationships among the columns of this combined matrix. So I invite you to think about it. I think it's very enjoyable to think about it. I remember not in not so distant past thinking about this as I was thinking of exercises for the book. And now I'm revealing the answer. The row reduced echelon form of this matrix would be two side-by-side -side identities. Okay. 
Okay. And why? Because in the original matrix, let's say it's five by five, so the sixth column equal the first, the seventh equal the second, and so forth. So in the eventual row reduced special on form, that relationship will be preserved. The sixth column will equal first, the seventh will equal second, and the first five will be the pivot columns because the matrix A is invertible. Okay, I'll throw in one more for which I'll reveal the answer. Let's put A, well actually I won't. So this will be perhaps your warm-up exercise. Put A next to A squared. Rather put A squared next to A. What's the row reduced echelon form of this matrix? That's a great question. Think about this question first. And make it, perhaps you might want to make it general. A to the N. Okay, and now here's the king of the questions from this series. What if you put the identity matrix next to A and perform the row reduced session on perform Gaussian elimination until you bring this combined matrix into two row reduced special on form? What will the row reduced special on form be when you're done? And as you're thinking about it, all of a sudden you realize that this is most likely a procedure that you're very much familiar with, except now you'll have perfect clarity as far as why it works. And this is perhaps the best explanation for why this technique works for what it does. So please think about these two questions. I'm sure you'll enjoy them very much. And uh, thank you very much. I'll... <laughs> I said that prematurely. So I'll definitely talk about this in, in the very near future. Okay, now, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed these. Actually, I wanted to share one more thought with you before the day is through. And here's the thought. This is something that you will also very much enjoy thinking about. So the row reduced special on form is for re revealing the relationship among the columns so you can figure out the null space. How about going backwards? Can you determine the row reduced session on form from the null space? If the null space is given in terms of some arbitrary basis, so for example, suppose that the null space looks like this A, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus B, 7, 8, minus 1, 12, and the question is, what is the row reduced echelon form of the matrix for which this is the null space? Now you know that this matrix has four columns, you don't know how many rows it has. So let's say it has three rows or five rows, it doesn't matter. So for any given number of rows, what is the matrix, what is the row reduced echelon form of the matrix? that has this null space. This question actually has an answer that's not at all complicated, and thinking about it is truly enjoyable. I, this time I promise I'm done. I'll see you next time.